Okay, so AI first design thinking, <laughs> lots of expectations, right? Let's go ahead and start with how we can leverage it in designing our products, having that mindset even as we de develop products in the workplace. Let's start with some definitions, maybe basics. AI and design thinking. Let's first start with design thinking. What is design thinking really? It is all about rapid development processes trying to get products faster, using some smaller prototypes, testing it out, and then iterating it for a broader audience, making it part of your product. That is really design thinking. There are five stages to it. First, you start with empathizing with the customer, their needs, pain points, and then you come up with some definition as to what is the problem I'm trying to solve? And then you ideate, throw in some ideas, brainstorm them, Come up with one or two ideas that will stick that is going to solve your problem. And of course, you prototype and then test the product itself. Well, if it's a hit, you make it mainstream, make it part of your product or service that you're offering. And now, AI. The whole buzz about it, right? Let's keep things very simple and basic. There's a toddler, right? Some of the parents here. When we teach our kids babies, toddlers, we say, we show a cat and we say, that's a cat, see, for cat. The toddler or the kid starts making impressions and mental maps on how a cat is supposed to look like. Eventually, after a couple of tries, no matter what color that cat is, the kid is going to be able to identify, oh, see, for cat. Let's look at AI. This is natural intelligence. Apply it to computers and systems. This is it. Being able to reason, make decisions, and learning from experiences, which in AI world, it's all about data. Learning from historical data, preferences, user preferences, et cetera. Give me one sec, sorry. So that's all it is, right? And all of it, it is powered by data, and data is your fuel. Apparently, oil is no longer the mainstream, it is data. <laughs> in our AI world, um, in our product management world and the technology world. Now, having defined that, let's now put these together, AI first, and into design thinking. How do we actually unlearn some of our design practices traditionally that we have had and try to apply artificial intelligence to it? Again, it doesn't have to be grand. It doesn't have to be something that is completely game-changing because when we talk about AI, where people are like, well, we think big, like self-driving cars, Tesla. Well, great, that is, yes, it is. But again, we use it in day-to-day -day world, right? Day-to-day -day experiences. Your Netflix movie recommendations, your LinkedIn uh, news feed and the connections that you have and speak of um, everything else, like Facebook, targeted ads, sometimes kind of creepy, right? Where it kind of tells you, gives you marketed or uh, targeted ads when you really haven't searched for it, but maybe had a dinner conversation about uh, how we want to take a vacation to Canada. And then because, and then I go search for something, and my husband has no idea about it, I'm searching. However, because we are related in Facebook, it knows that couples take vacations together, and then it appears on my husband's homepage or what, you know, uh, Facebook. That's kind of creepy, and how do we not get into those, right? It is all about defining your objective as to what you want to accomplish with that. That is where AI components comes into picture. Um, some components. There are three steps to it, or three components to AI. The first is you start with the objective. What is it that you want your algorithm to achieve? The algorithm to be able to do your movie Netflix recommendations versus predicting the stock market trends is going to be obviously different. But that objective is going to define everything. Are you going to let your AI run loose and be unsupervised, or are we going to have some really good parameters around how it should work? It is definitely important. And as product managers, it is super crucial for us to play a big part in that and then be able to define that objective as closely as possible to the outcome that you want to achieve. And number two, the algorithm itself. 
Are we going to write those algorithms as product managers? Of course not. But it is very important that we understand what we are actually leading. Because without understanding and grasping, there's not much we can do about it. So let's look at the algorithms. Very macro level, right? Not going to bore you with the details. There's three kinds of algorithms. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforced learning. The first two are probably self-explanatory. In supervised, let's look at an example. You have your email box. <clears throat> and there is AI in that as well, in your Gmail, where it actually tries to separate out your spam with your unimportant and important and promotions. It does it with supervised learning, which means it looks for some keywords and then tries to bucket them where you know what those parameters are, tries to bucket them, put those into them, uh, into those buckets. And over time, it knows the stuff that you are putting in spam versus sometimes you're making some things important, which it might have thought it as a promotion. That's how it learns. And let's look at unsupervised. Most of your Netflix movie recommendations or even uh, Amazon video, I should say, I don't want them to be left out because you're pretty popular too. Um, that is pretty unsupervised. Have we, I personally, when I look at Netflix or Amazon video, I don't rate any of them myself. Hell, I don't even put many of the user preferences. However, it learns over time based on my data and of course, based on people that are my age and gender maybe, tries to give all of those recommendations. It is very unsupervised that way. It makes its decisions. It provides inputs and insights. Number three, that would be the reinforced learning, which is the most powerful model. As an example, it can start playing chess within just four hours of learning, reinforcement learning, and could be the best chess player. <clears throat> And I think we have seen it with the generative AI and whatnot, but then reinforced learning is one of the most popular ones. And number three, and I would say it's the foremost, it's the food for these algorithms. It's like food for the plants with like light and sun, light and water. That is data. You have to have data in order to power your algorithms. Without it, it's like not being able to drive the car. And I think we all know about this, how data is the one that powers all of this. And that is how you identify user trends and figure out what is it the user wants. And being able to create products that are relevant to the users before they even know that they would like for it, or they would want it. Those are the components. Let's talk about the benefits of uh, this really, of this uh, AI first design thinking. The user experience, I think we all know this as well. We are good users of it. However, as product management managers in our companies, are we leveraging this user experience that is super personalized to every user and trying to identify those trends and leveraging data uh, for doing all of that? I'm thinking answer is probably like a, either a 30, 70, 40, 60 approach where, yes, we do some of them, some of us who are working in FANG maybe. Uh, personally, in my company, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, where I'm in the cloud services division, I can tell you, not too proud about it, we are yet to start that wave. We do very good analytics, and that's my team basically. However, we're not looking at the uh, current user usage, the past usage, trying to draw meaning out of it, and trying to co come up with uh, the forecasting for such users to be able to uh, navigate their cloud usage, for example, which we could be doing. <clears throat> That is the user experiences part. And better efficiencies within the product development process. For example, your code automation in terms of the reviews, code reviews can be automated to some extent in order to reduce the errors and also some security concerns. Number three, of course, it is brand differentiation based on how you can come up with competitive products that are using product innovation to be able to come out on the top so we are not obsolete, so we are able to come out with products that are faster, go going to market, and delivering it to our users. Those are the benefits. Now let's talk about some case studies as to where we see it. I think we, all along we have been looking at some of the case studies that movies recommendations, Tesla or self-driving cars and whatnot. How can you really leverage it within your work, at your work, right? We have to start somewhere. And I gave an example about how I could be doing, uh, I could be getting buy-in from my leadership around using 
using all of this data and trying to have this AI first mindset within it and learning some of it and trying to leverage data as much as possible so we can come up with those user experiences. Um, and then finally, I think I would talk about challenges. We all think about, we are all, you know, uh, given this information about, oh my God, there's ethics, there's bias within AI, we need to be careful with all of that. Well, there's four things. Uh, there is data collection and the privacy issues, which with generative AI itself, I think some companies have blocked it completely due to privacy concerns. Again, we're not talking generative AI, but in terms of the data collection itself, there is some privacy concerns that we need to keep in mind. For example, the Facebook targeted ads that I will be getting when I will become uncomfortable that it's actually even doing so. And then number two being it's uh, the ethics and the bias. Think about it, right? I'm a big DE&I um, proponent, a diversity, equity, inclusion proponent. It all comes down to data. If that is the case, we don't live in a perfect world today where we are striving for equality between men and women and other under, underrepresented groups. If we let AI make those decisions and make those calls based on historical data and user preferences, will that be fair? I don't think so. We'll be finding ourselves in the same problems that we have today. If not, it's going to be more. At least today, people, we can think and go, okay, well, yeah, we absolutely have to have equality, but no, within AI, to be able to leverage the best of it, you're gonna have to rewrite those algorithms, have cross-functional algorithms, take a look at it. And I don't know how we're gonna do it, but that bias is a challenge that we will need to uh, monitor and make sure we take into our product decisions as well. Um, I guess, what is the future? Now let's come down to the end of it, and then we'll have some Q&A. I think we'll have about 12, 13 minutes of Q&A here. <clears throat> Future, does anyone know what the statistic is in terms of a, um, how many companies are leveraging AI today in their products? Okay, well, it is about 37 to 40% of the companies, which is a pretty big number. And that number is about to increase to about 60% just by 2025. And by the end of 2030, it's going to reach about 80%. Some staggering numbers, right? And nine out of 10 companies today, if not have AI in their products, they haven't really released them, but they are investing in those. Now is the time for us to get ahead of it. As product managers, you might ask, how can I actually go start this? Yes, it is huge. It is not just about saying, hey, let's just go, uh, let's look at some user trends, let's leverage data and try to make personal recommendations. It's not that simple. However, we can take the first step today, experiment with it, try to get buy-in from our management and leadership and see how we could actually put that AI first in our design thinking so we are not going to be left obsolete because we know if we are not going to get on this train, someone else is, and we're gonna be left behind. So that's something you can do today. Hopefully it is inspiring us to take some action. What, do one or two things today and then maybe to talk about it in your town halls or team meetings about how this was presented and how they, we should be ahead of the curve. And then eventually with that buy-in and influence, leaders will also start realizing it. And of course, many companies are already investing in it. That way, as product managers, if we are doing so, and then we will know that we are going to be in the forefront leading this whole innovation thing and developing the best products that we need for our customers. Thank you. Apologies for the um, confusion with my laptop. <laughs> it kind of threw off my train of thought there for a bit, but I hope you got uh, everything out of this session. Let's go into a quick Q&A because we have some time, looks like. Yes. For the algorithms itself, you know what? That's a good question. I have no idea the, of what they are using. I'm assuming a lot of all of the fan companies, of course, use it. And if I were to guess, a lot of that is unsupervised because you know how YouTube and Netflix could be. I look at one video on YouTube, for example, I click on one ad and then try to go donate for St. Jude's Hospital. 
I'm ki not kidding you, every single time I get the same ad again. Which I'm like, yes, I did donate it. I don't want to keep seeing those ads just because I looked at what it one time. Or click on a um, you know video that says, how do I reduce my blood pressure? I'm like, I don't want to feel like a patient every time I go to Google, uh, every time I go to YouTube where it actually presents, um, oh, these are some of the related videos. But of course, you can go and delete it in the history and whatnot. But I'm assuming it is a lot of it is unsupervised. And that's why it goes back to the definition of its objective it has to be super clear. It is easy to make it very super simplified in a way that it's going to be um, super going to negative consequences very fast. At the same time, we can actually leverage it to put really good parameters in place and make it a combination of supervised and unsupervised so you know that you cannot step in step in other shoes like be making people uncomfortable to a point and vulnerable where it tells me i'm like i don't want it to, to tell me ads when i don't even you know google for it for example that's it i hopefully it answered it but then uh, you know maybe there's something to look it up yes sure. go ahead Mm -hmm. Combination of medical uh, skills as well as we can check to see the interaction with with, uh, with the patient. And Chat GPT frankly hallucinates often, and so we have a problem in terms of people want to start to handle their healthcare issues. And I think this is a case, particularly acute mind issue, but a hallucination happens in every AI application. We just don't. It's very popular. You know, okay, um, that's a good question. Can you explain, even for the context of the broader audience, what, give me an example of what you mean by ChatGPT hallucinating in context of the medical field in the questions. I, I wonder, I'm actually curious to know how it, or what it does. Give, if you have a specific example, sounds like you've experienced it. Um, I, I, I've experienced it. words that appear and they are in the exact proper form because they're statistically exact so the formation of the citation is exactly well understood by that and it creates things that are whole thought. Oh I know exactly what you're talking about. So that's an example, but I could also come up with all sorts of other prompts that a, that a patient uh, consumer might give to the system that that start with a false premise or a false assertion and that chat GPT Yes, absolutely. I know exactly what you're talking about. Chat GPT can lie so confidently that it you will actually think that is the truth. <clears throat> and I've experienced it myself. Again, we need to differentiate generative AI with some of the AI first design thinking we are talking about here. And what you're saying is, well, it's absolutely true, right? It can definitely lie super confidently. It, its sources are not always accurate. Even if I ask for the sources sometimes, it gives me some sources that I'm like, I know that it's not correct. And I need to Google to Google to actually say, okay, is that real? Even. So I would say there's distinct differences between the two. For that the whole generative AI and how do you catch it in a lie, I do think we have another t topic coming up today on just that one topic. So you might want to visit that. But then these two are a little bit different. What I'm saying is that you leverage it into your products, embed into your products, or use it in your design, in your product development process. You use the data from the customers and the sales data to be able to make those decisions. 
That is slightly different from using generative AI to go and make my job easier. For example, I can go ask ChatGDP to write use cases, some demo features, um, you know, try to get some marketing content for go to market, the GTM stuff. So that's slightly different in the context of at least usage and how product managers could have the design thinking in first place. Yes. You did mention that uh, I mean some of the AI solutions tend to get creepier and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like uh, invasion to your privacy. But uh, say, for example, I go and Google search uh, how to make pancakes, and if that recommendation sort of appears in Instagram search, it's sort of beneficial for me, right? So when you actually go and uh, uh, implement this design thinking, uh, and both two personas are conflicting in the case. For example, for me, it's beneficial. For you, it's uh, intruding into your privacy. Exactly. How do you handle this sort of uh, dialogue? That is apps. Your five minutes. Five minute minutes. Thank you. That is absolutely a dilemma, right? Just like. That's where part of the AI ethics comes into picture. Maybe not just for the specific example, something that I might find creepy or I might be a private person and you might be like public and you might want to post a lot of things and whatnot. And that is where I believe the user preferences comes into picture. It has to be a combination of my preferences, what I have put in so from a privacy standpoint, it could be, or it could even use the, um, the, the algorithms could use a combination of what my statistics say was to, okay, so I'm a woman like in, the, in 30s and then I could have all of this. And instead of just going by historical data as to what I'm Googling for and what it is, it should be a combination of that, like a supervised and unsupervised part. And also taking privacy concerns. So for example, we have all of those things that says, okay, do you want to share this information with Facebook, for example, and turning off those uh, from a personalized level, those can be measures that uh, organizations can actually embed to be able to com combat it. I don't know if that's helpful, but that is how I would see it, right? Um, it has to be, it cannot be running haywire. It cannot be doing decisions on its own 100% of the time. Because for example, it's, I have a goal of, okay, me wanting to learn more about you know product management and all of these lofty goals. And then I go, my monkey mind, let's say, I go and Google for something else like time waster. We all know what those time wasters are on social media. What I don't want it to do is keep giving recommendations that is based on my initial search because that only makes it more and more. The more it links it provides and recommendations, the more I'm going to look at it. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Instead, it can be like, well, these are your goals. Do you want to like, you know, have more content related to your goals like product management and leadership skills and whatnot? That's the key to it, I would think because I have been prey to it myself, actually. I'll go look at one thing on like YouTube, and then all of the recommendations are like that. I'm like, great, I don't want to look at any of that now. <laughs> yes? I, I think you're sort of highlighting you know, this whole thing in terms of this AI as being something that is linked in to or potentially is linked in to the user experience. Um, and then you're pointing to things like getting search on the one thing and then it's sort of like exponentially becoming more potent as a learning tool. And you've sort of touched on some of the ways that that might be mitigated, including user preferences and things like that. I'm wondering if you have any other sort of examples that you maybe feel companies are doing to mitigate that problem instead of getting into too much detail. This happens with me all the time where I'm either on Twitter or or whatever, and it's just like, I want to start seeing something new, right? <laughs> is there an easier way than having to go to Google preferences and say, I want to see this yes. versus this? Should it be showing you random stuff from time to time? Should, you know, what, 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 what are some other ways? Um, that's indeed a good topic, too. Netflix, for example, does the whole surprise me, I don't know if you have seen that, surprise me, which it does give you random videos from time to time. I don't know specifically what other companies are um, doing over there, 
but that's one thing I have seen and read about. And putting it into context as to how we could apply it, this is where the objective comes into picture. We have to have parameters on how we can actually make the objective super clear, not make it oversimplified, and then hone in on the details so you can actually avoid some of it. And for users who don't mind doing so, or who don't mind being like public and whatnot, maybe there is some parameters around that based on their preferences that you could have AI go, just learn whatever, unsupervised and provide them. So I don't know if that helps or not, but other companies not sure, but I am certainly sure that Netflix does that with the random videos. Um, and YouTube, if you don't want to see something, you can go to the history and delete that particular video and it will not show it to you again. Actually, I don't know if I try that. Sorry, one more question. I think we're out of time. One minute. Okay. okay. Absolutely. That is where automation comes into picture, right? Where you're, you can use it for your code reviews to minimize errors and security concerns. That's one of it. And throughout the product development process, you take an input, which is user data, right? Sales data, make intelligent use of it and say, okay, where are my user trending, users trending? What is that they want? And you can use that to come up with newer ideas and provide innovative products to your customers eventually. That is how, that is part of using it within your product development process itself. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much guys for listening in and joining me today.